Voters in Massachusetts decided last month to legalize the use of marijuana for medical purposes, but putting the law into practice means having new regulations put in place by the state and local communities. Officials in Boston have started getting ready, and a hearing was held this week by the city council. Much of the talk was about the requirement for making the drug available at dispensaries. Our guest has been following the story for the Boston Phoenix, and we'd like to welcome Chris Ferrone. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Chris. Always a pleasure. There's some of us who didn't read this law too carefully when we voted either for it or against mm -hmm. it. Uh, so aside from what I mentioned about it, what does this bring into effect exactly? You know, let's first thing to keep in mind is that this is like a shell of a law. This is almost, you know, this is essentially a, a law saying that the Department of Public Health at the state level really needs to figure everything out now. Uh, so some of the things that are definitely in place is that the law does take place on January 1st. Uh, the Department of Public Health has 120 days from that date, which is May, about May 1st, um, to, to basically figure out all these parameters, everything from what will constitute a 60-day supply, um, what the dispensary system will look like. I mean, there really are it, it, countless issues that, that are coming up now. And so what we're seeing is the process around that. And there's also a clock ticking here because if the uh, public sector can't do something at a certain time, then the general public will have the, the right to do some things, I guess. They will, even if they do do it on time. So let's say in best case scenario, it does come out by May 1st, uh, the Department of Public Health regulations. Even that window before that, that 120 days, roughly four months, people can grow their own supply. Uh, that, I, that, you know, I don't think, honestly, that's what's going to happen, that everyone's just going to be up and doing that. But it, it, you know, the way it's written in right now, uh, that would be a, um, a possibility. Now, it's very important to remember that you know, there's also forces at the state level. You know, when, uh, we're going to see probably, uh, we're going to see motions to, ch to give us a stay to the Department of Public Health so they'll have some more time. Uh, nothing's written in stone yet, there, but you're, you're going to see a lot of action on Beacon Hill with you know, uh, an attempt to postpone. Right now, I, I sense from some of what was going on in City Hall, there is an equating, uh, maybe not exactly, but a little bit with uh, places where people go for, let's say, methadone treatment. And, and there's, there's a great aversion to having us in my neighborhood. Uh, right. And I can think of some neighbors in Boston where this is not going to go over very well. You know, it's interesting. I mean, you know, so th this is a lot of even issues around just that topic right there because there, there are studies um, that, uh, in other places where they have dispensary systems, Colorado in particular, that show alcohol use, uh, prescription drug abuse, all these things actually go down around uh, dispensaries and in places where, you know, there is medical marijuana. Uh, also, violent crime is not does not necessarily go up around everywhere. California is a different story. They have a dispensary system that's out of control, and that's not what Massachusetts is going to look like. And we can talk about the parameters of that in a moment, but, um, you know, really, as far as where they go, that's what cities have to figure out. So that's what the Boston City Council had a hearing on Monday. They have to figure out the zoning. Where can these go? Where can these not go? The Boston Redevelopment Authority has already taken a step toward figuring this out. They're going to classify them underneath health care, uh, but as their own thing. So, you know, they won't be the same as pharmacies, which are like health care retail establishments. They will not be the same as methadone clinics. Uh, as far as the comparisons, listen, there is no comparison as far as the actual drugs that we're talking about here. But I do understand the council, what, you know, what some of the counselors are concerned about. Um, but maybe, you know, once a little bit more education is out there, they'll realize really, you know, um, I don't want to use the disparaging term junkies, but when we think about these methadone clinics, I mean, anybody who's ever been to the Haymarket area knows that there's a lot of addicts hanging around there. That's not the case with a medical marijuana dispensary. On the other end, uh, there are things that are given out in pharmacies with prescriptions mm -hmm. that are much more addicting than marijuana. So why do we need to take these kind of precautions? Um, I mean, first of all, you know, this, this is a high value product regardless, but you know, everywhere that there are responsible dispensary systems, uh, like um, you know, Maine, Colorado, um, th they have security. I mean, this is, it's not a free for all. So, and uh, you know, from the sense I get already, those who are interested in opening dispensaries, there's gonna be a rapport with police. So you know, a lot of those safety concerns I really think can be, um, can be put to rest. Uh, in other cities and towns, people are kind of freaking out. Uh, I don't want to call out any specific ones. I can't remember off the top of my head who has actually banned it, but there have been some town meetings that have said not at all. There will be none. Uh, of course, under the laws it's written now, those people who, um, people who need m medical marijuana in those areas will be able to grow their own even after the dispensary system is in place. So I think a lot of places that rushed to ban uh, dispensaries are now uh, saying, oh man, now what have we maybe opened the door to?
One of the other stories you've been following was involved in maybe the most intense fireworks this week in the city council chambers, <coughs> and that's about uh, the, the racial makeup of leadership in city departments, and I guess the police department is certainly one area of concern. Uh, you were writing about uh, the Patrolman's Association, yes. police union's concern about the exam, uh, and is concerned that this exam might be unfair too, the promotional exam. Yeah, uh, you know, so the MAMLIO, the uh, Massachusetts Association of Minority Law Enforcement Officers have been uh, you know, have sparking up a dialogue about this for a long time. Uh, my, what I specifically wrote about was the Boston Police Union has a long time publication called the Pax Centurion, which is their kind of like internal newsletter uh, comes out um, every every other month usually, and it's extremely disparaging toward uh, black and female officers, uh, minority and female officers, and that's you know right there in the police union newsletter. And what I essentially wrote was that I understand that this is not, say, the opinion of all white officers, but that message, and particularly the message that nothing can be done about the exam, and that that there's nothing that should be done to increase the numbers of you know, minorities, women at, in the superior officer ranks, that's what's coming through. You know, that, that's what's coming through in the union newsletter that represents all of the rank and file officers. Um, so you know, that's essentially, uh, it's more of the sentimental side. You know, the, there's the reality, what's going to be done about it. And, uh, and we, we saw in City Hall this week how, how sensitive just that topic on its, uh, on its face is. Uh, I'll be following it further. Uh, um, uh, I wish I didn't miss the, the the fireworks in the city hall chamber the other day, in the Ionella chamber the other day, but uh, it will be interesting to see it in the future. All right. Well, you've also um, pretty much written the book on the Occupy movement, and it, sometimes it seems like a, such a long time ago since they were camped out there. And is there anything that you can say is a lasting consequence of this? Yeah. Well, um, you know, first of all, it was about it was about a year to the last eviction last week. Uh, from the eviction of, of Dewey Square in Camden. And uh, since then, um, you know, a lot of stuff, especially out of New York, Occupy Sandy, uh, that's still going strong. A lot of the re hurricane relief efforts came from Occupy-related sources. Um, you know, you'll see occupiers all over the place, though. So, you know, for example, John Murphy, who is a, a regular down at Dewey Square, I was at a, uh, a pro-labor rally the other day at Faneuil Hall, a huge one. The whole place was packed. Um, you know, Mass Uniting, other sorts of groups, uh, Jobs with Justice were organizing that. And there was John Murphy. There was someone from Occupy Boston talking about his experience at Occupy Boston. So it's kind of, I always said that when I was at Occupy Boston, you know, having covered the activist beat for a long time, I'd always, you know, I'd always see those characters. And now it's, it's those people, but also other people who, you know, kind of got into the, the, the activist mold at Occupy Boston, who I'm, I've now seen you know, working with a number of other groups. I always thought that um, all this 99% uh, versus the 1% really conditioned us in a certain way so that when we heard Mitt Romney talk about the 47%, I think we reacted in a different way than we would have otherwise. You know, it was interesting. The 47% was interesting. I listen to a lot of conservative radio, so uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a masochist. So, uh, but really, uh, that, that's, that's, it's been a longstanding line, conservative dialogue. Um, but people really were able to understand it now. So, you know, conservatives have been saying for a long time that half of America doesn't pay any taxes. People were just like, what is that even, what are they even talking about? Mitt Romney actually broke it down, trying to explain this, this, you know, the illogic of his. And people were able to understand, okay, this is, you know, they understand wealth disparity a little more. So, in the very least, it was an education, you know, an education for a lot of people who weren't uh, otherwise enlightened to the reality. Thank you very much for being with us, Thank for you. enlightening us. Chris Ferrone of the Boston Phoenix will have more news in just a moment.